Hey everybody. This is my T-Bar Cichlid. And recently I thought she had been injured. I thought she got banged in the head a little bit and had some injuries. I had sort of ruled out hole in the head disease, although that was my initial thought. And one of my viewers pointed out that to them it did look like hole in the head disease. So, since I have exactly zero personal experience with it, I thought I would take their word for it and do a little more research. It's been quite a while since I've actually looked into hole in the head disease. And after doing a little bit of research, I sort of quickly came to the conclusion that I believe they're right. I really do think this is hole in the head disease and not some sort of superficial injury. So, she's kind of shy. She hides a lot. Um, that's why I put some food in the tank just now so we'd get to see her out and about for a few moments. I hope you got to see those little sort of spots on her forehead and kind of around her eye. That's what we're talking about there. You can see her again, those little white marks. So, I did some research. I did a lot of reading. I read a lot of different pages about hole in the head disease or head and lateral line erosion disease. And it's pretty much what I remember reading about from years ago, and that is that nobody really knows what it is, what causes it, how to treat it. It's a lot of speculation, and it's a lot of people who have their ideas, it's a lot of people who have their way of treating it, but there's not a lot of real, positive, solid, definitive information out there as to what it is. So... The best we can figure is that it is some sort of little, um, I think it's a bacterium. I can't remember what it's called. All I can remember is the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy with the mice suddenly dropping dead of myxomatosis. Um, it's hexamitis or hexamatitis or something like that. It, it's not important. It's some little microbial life that is thought to live within the fish naturally. And there's some people who speculate that it is the cause of the hole in the head disease. There's other people that speculate that it is simply opportunistic. If there's some other factor that allows it to take hold, then you begin having issues with it. Um, Post-mortems that have been done on fish with the hole in the head disease do seem to indicate that it has some role to play, but nobody's quite sure what. And when it gets into causes, it's just as much debate about cause. Uh, the most unusual one that I read about was there are some people who believe that the low voltage electrical currents that flow through our tanks because of all of the you know, heaters and lights we have right above them is what actually contributes to causing this. Now, at first, I kind of thought that was a little out in left field. And the more I thought about it, that's not as far-fetched as it sounds when you consider that the holes in the head and the lateral line itself are all sensory pores. And that's where you get the erosion from these pores. And it's believed, I almost envisioned it like a pimple or something, like these pores, these sensory pores, get these hexamatitis or whatever they are that develop in them. And then apparently they either develop pus or pustules develop around them. And that's where you start getting these outward expressions and you start seeing these lesions develop. So by the time you can see the lesions, it's been going on for a little while. But those pores, and of course on the lateral line on fish, those are all sensory organs. And so if it was an electrical signal that was doing it, it's possible that that might have some sort of effect. Again, that seems a little out in left field for me. But the, the point is, is that there's a lot of speculation as to what can cause a uh, hole in the head disease. One of the very common uh, causes that is speculated upon and it's one of the reasons I don't use activated carbon in any of my tanks is a lot of people think activated carbon is a contributing factor to um, given fish hole in the head disease and I decided a long time ago that if it might be a factor in causing an illness and it's not something I actually need in my tank which most people don't really need activated carbon in their tank they just put it in there at a habit but since I don't need it, and if it may cause problems, and it costs me money to put it in the tank, why put it in there? And so I've never used activated carbon. There are a lot of people that speculate vitamin deficiencies from improper diets or imbalanced diets. 
could possibly be it. And of course, the elephant in the room with my tanks is tank conditions, nitrates, uh, water quality, etc. So my water quality is usually good. I don't have dirty water in the sense that there's a lot of microbial life and all that. But I do let the nitrates get up there. I've done many, many videos about it. I'm very controversial in my views on nitrates. So there are some people, and this basically boils down to every single disease that comes across the aquarium community, nitrates, high nitrates are thought to be a contributing factor. Well, they, everybody says that about everything all the time. So of course we know high nitrates are thought to be a contributing factor, but apparently so is using activated carbon, so is not feeding them properly, so is having electrical equipment around your tank. Nobody knows what causes hole in the head disease apparently. So my tanks have actually been, this tank I've been staying on top of um, as far as keeping it clean. I don't know what the nitrates actually are, but I'm sure if we tested, they would be up in the red. They're nowhere near down like the five or 10 parts per million. They're probably closer to, you know, 40 to 60 parts per million. Although I just did a pretty big water change and filter cleaning and everything tonight, but we'll get into that in a moment. Um, the other, the final main cause that seems to be one of the um, usual suspects is stress. You know, none of this came as a surprise to me. All of it is the kind of stuff that will suppress an animal's immune system. Stress, poor diet, poor, you know, physical conditions, being bullied around, you know, physical injuries, anything that's going to suppress the animal's immune system. So, being in a stressful situation, I, you know, I don't see this fish being really overly stressed out. The only thing I've been thinking today is that big pleco I have in here. It's a veritable poop machine. I did a big gravel vac today. I probably gravel vac 14 pounds of fish poop out of here. And that's only been a couple weeks since I did a pretty good gravel vac in the last time. So... With the size of the fish, the amount of waste it produces, maybe I am getting more, you know, dirty water conditions than I think I am. And that's a possibility. It's also a possibility that the fish is a big meanie. And just because I don't see it happening doesn't mean that that pleco is not in there stressing out my other fish, possibly even trying to latch onto its side or something like that. Although I would imagine if that was going to be the case, it would be happening to my angelfish, not this cichlid and that of course wouldn't really cause hole in the head disease that would just cause physical injuries that i'd be able to see from the slime coat being destroyed so that brings us back to what do we do about it you know so moving on to treatment options we get into all of the same kind of treatment options that everybody throws out there for every fish disease. There's different people now, you know, obviously, you know, not everything is thrown out there, but there's three or four uh, main medications. I can't think of any of them off the top of my head. One I want to say is like metro metronazinol or something like that. It's a pretty common uh, medication and it's a pretty common ingredient in a variety of medications. So while most people have their preference, they all seem to contain the same medication and it's just seems to me like it's this sort of generic kind of or not generic but sort of this broad range like it kills anything tiny it kills microbes it kills fungus it kills parasites and it just kind of brings me back to the idea like we don't know what we're doing here do we we're just throwing this stuff at it and hoping that it kills whatever might be causing the issue and so on and so forth so I'm not overly keen on getting in here and doing a lot of medicating on the tank. I've had bad uh, experiences. That was interesting watching those. I know you all didn't see it, but I saw it coming out of the corner of my eye. Those two Siamese algae eaters were schooling with those hatchet fish, and they were all coming down here together. That was pretty neat looking. But I'm not really keen on putting a lot of medication in the tank. I've had issues in the past. I'll tell you, the bulk of my experience with medication has been that it has either done nothing at all, I wasted a lot of time, money, and effort, and I just watched the fish get worse and worse and died. 
that's been my overall positive experience with the medicine. More often than that, however, when I would use medication, I wound up having fish that were perfectly fine suddenly drop dead. And while I couldn't swear in a court of law that it was the medication that did it without an autopsy, I'm pretty sure it was the medication that did it. In the cases I'm talking about, it was Pemafix. I later found out that uh, Pemafix does contain the same chemical, or I've been told that Pemafix contains the same chemical compound that is in clove oil, which of course we use to euthanize our fish. So overdosing it with Pemafix just a little bit can kill otherwise healthy fish. And every time I used Pemafix, except for once, I had not only the fish that was sick die, but I had other fish that were not sick suddenly drop dead. The only time I've ever used medication successfully was, ironically, with Pemafix. Um, this angelfish, oh, nope, I'm sorry, I've got him in a different tank. I was going to look at the tank next door here. Uh, the angelfish that I now have in my 20-gallon down here, it used to be in my office tank, that was sort of a rescue fish. It came home, it had fuzz growing on its lips, it was clearly dying. If, it, if somebody didn't do something, it was a dead fish swimming. And so I brought it home and I treated it with Pemafix, but I used about a third of a dose. I didn't even use a full half dose. And I salted the tank and I kept the tank nice and clean and I kept the fish in low light and low stress and it recovered. So that kind of brings me to my final point and that is the way I treated that fish. The medication was only part of that treatment. Now, in that case, the fish had white fuzz growing on its lips, so it's a pretty safe bet that it really did need some sort of antifungal uh, type uh, medication, which is what the Pemafix was primarily for. That's why I put the Pemafix in there with it. But the Pemafix was still part of a treatment program. That's my massage therapist coming out of me. Um, and the treatment program included the Pemafix, but it also included keeping the water clean, reducing the stress, adding salt to the aquarium, lowering the lights, and so on and so forth. So the medication helped, but so did all the other stuff. If I had only medicated it, would it have survived in a high stress situation? Probably not. The medication probably would not have been enough to get it better. The fish's own immune system had to do most of the work. So when we're looking at all of these different medications that they're talking about for hole in the head disease and the way to treat them, every page I looked at said the same thing. It offered basically a treatment plan and the treatment plan always involved the same stuff. Do your maintenance, do a gravel vac, get the water nice and clean, change your filter, lower the stress, you know, remove any fish that might be harassing the fish and so on and so forth and use medication XYZ because this is the only brand to use and it's the one that'll cure your problem and what that sort of reminds me of I know there's different advertising standards in different places in the world but here in America you will very commonly see I know this is gonna sound weird for a moment but bear with me uh, you will very commonly see breakfast cereal advertised and the way this treatment plan it, to me, it's like a breakfast cereal treatment plan. And what I mean by that is when you see an advertisement for breakfast cereal, you'll see a picture of a bowl of cereal that's basically sugar O's. And next to it will be a glass of milk, and you'll have a glass of juice, and you'll have half a grapefruit, and you might have a little bowl of nuts or something next to it. And you'll have this big statement saying that, you know, sugar O's is part of this nutritious breakfast. And that's true. It is part of a nutritious breakfast, but it's the worst part. And if you actually took the sugar O's out of the equation, you would still have a very healthy breakfast. In fact, in that situation, you'd have a healthier breakfast without the cereal than you would with the what's being advertised. And that, to me, seems like the same sort of scenario with the treatment program. The medication is part of a treatment program, when in reality, do we even know if the treatment's actually doing anything? To me, the, the greater part of the treatment 
seems to be exactly what I've already been doing, and that's been trying to do more maintenance on the tank. I got in there again today. As I said, I did a big uh, water change. I did about a 50% water change. I did a big gravel vac, which I don't always do. And then, of course, I changed out the filter. And I've changed the filter recently, so it's not like it really needed a big filter change. But I did it anyway, and I got the filter nice and clean. So the water, you know, for as far as this tank goes, it's about as clean as it gets. And we're just going to wait and see what happens. Now, sadly, I will finish up with the prognosis, and generally it's not good. Most of the time, even with treatment, the fish just generally get worse and worse and worse until eventually you either need to euthanize them or they die on their own. But sometimes they do clear up and get better, and we're going to wait and see. This isn't a really bad case. I've certainly seen fish a lot worse than that. And I've seen fish live for years with small lesions that never really grow or get worse or anything else. So we'll wait and see. And I'll reconsider my options with the Pleco in here. It might be getting about time to get it out. I'm really surprised we haven't seen it uh, during this whole video. It's a pretty big fish. It's hard to hide in this tank, but I do have a fair amount of Anubiates in this tank, so it's not that hard to hide, I suppose, if you just wanted to lay low on the backside of that. Anyway, that's all I can really think of to say about what's going on with my T-bar here. But, alas, I do believe this is hole-in-the-head disease and not a simple bump on the forehead as I originally thought. So make sure you're subscribed and I'll be doing updates and we'll follow along and see how she does and hopefully we'll get some more years out of her or possibly she'll heal up and get better. I don't know, but if you're subscribed you won't miss any of that or anything else. So don't forget this one is my T-bar tank. Thanks for watching and I'll see you real soon in the next one.